This is what the first insulin pump looked like when it was invented in the 1960s. Could you imagine having to wear something like this? And this is what a continuous glucose monitor used to look like. Now I just have one on my arm right there. Today, I'm taking you through the history of diabetes technology. Since the discovery of insulin in the 1920s, diabetes technology has evolved to make living with diabetes easier and easier. Today I'm exploring the people who helped drive diabetes tech further, the progression of innovations, and the journey to get to an artificial pancreas. It definitely gives me Star Trek vibes. <laughs> yeah. You'll see some of the earliest blood glucose meters, the first continuous glucose monitors, and an implantable insulin pump still used by patients today. This injector is, is basically what goes through. If you're left wanting more, I've got a bunch of deleted scenes on the Diabetic Patreon which you can access in the show notes. And if this video gets over a thousand likes, I'll produce a series covering the history and stories behind diabetes innovations. All right, let's get into it. To help me tell this story, I visited Medtronic in Los Angeles to tour its diabetes museum. Medtronic paid for my trip expenses, but had no control over my reporting or production. I spoke with Ali Dianati, Medtronic's Senior Vice President of Product Innovation and Operations. Medtronic is one of the largest diabetes tech producers. How long has Medtronic been around? It's gonna be our 75th anniversary coming up pretty soon. Uh, so really, really humble beginnings. It started in a garage with Earl Bakken and his brother-in-law. Really, the company started on the premise of actually repairing medical equipment. He was helping the University of Minnesota's hospital with some of their equipment and on a starstruck night, power went out in their local area it was in Minnesota and they actually lost some patients because they were plugged into a wall and they were actively pacing uh, their hearts to keep them alive. And so from that point, the whole premise of what Medtronic is today really got sparked. Uh, and really what Earl had done is take a machine that had to be plugged into the wall and make it independently powered, and then therefore a patient could have the means of being able to have their heart working 24 seven without the need um, to be plugged in. Medtronic would become the biggest medical device company. It works on pacemakers and defibrillators to neuromodulation devices for deep brain and spinal cord stimulation. Medtronic found that the devices it produced shared many comorbidities with diabetes, and it was the natural next frontier. In 2001, Medtronic set its eyes on Minimed. This company was founded by Alfred Mann in 1983. Mann also comes from a background in pacemakers. And so they decided, uh, it was the early 2000s, to actually purchase what was Minimed from Al Mann and uh, effectively become part of the diabetes space. They already had pumps on the market. Uh, they had a CGM, which was really more for healthcare provider to actually see what's going on because back then most people were using blood glucose meters, of course. At-home glucose meters didn't arrive until the early 1970s. So these are the initial blood glucose meters. As you can see here, they're big, but these were all intended to be tabletop at home. They usually had used what they called chips or cartridges instead of strips um, back then. They would get a cartridge, they would put their blood into it, and then they would open up the socket, put it through into this area here, they would slide it in. Um, and then this meter would go right or left, and then they would have to adjust uh, to the number that they were at. And so let's just say, you know, if they're at 120, they would be trying to get this to be centered um, inside of there. So this is just like when you get on the scale at the doctor yeah. and you're moving the yes, weights. exactly right. That's a perfect. Uh, wow. Uh, and I love how like this is called the stat tech and it definitely gives me Star Trek vibes. <laughs> yeah. A little bit. I could see that. There was also the Ames iTone, released in Europe and in the US in 1973. This actually gives you a measurement once you put the cartridge in it. And you know, you can kind of tell it looks like an old school transistor radio because that was the technology that was around, right? And so when you look at even the sides, the jacks and whatnot that are in are just like a radio would have. As time went on, the tech improved, getting smaller and smaller. Meanwhile, in the early 1960s, one man was looking into not just viewing glucose levels, but providing treatment with a pump. 
So this was actually the first uh, insulin pump that we're aware of. It's completely mechanically driven uh, for all intents and purposes. It was basically a pneumatic system. And so what it would have is a, a reservoirs that were holding pressure and then valves that would open and then that would essentially infuse um, insulin into the body. Pretty tricky um, setup to deal with because each one of these valves had like a different flow rate, a different basal rate, so to speak. Um, and so, you know, you would turn them on and off in order to make sure that that, you know, all kind of balanced out for whoever was using it. The pump was developed by Dr. Arnold Kadish. It was a closed loop pump. It measured glucose levels every 15 seconds through an IV line and provided treatment with that information. It was also a dual hormone pump. Two intravenous syringe pumps turned on and off to keep the user's glucose in target. One used insulin to lower glucose levels and the other glucagon, which helped raise glucose when it dropped too low. This pump never took off partly due to its size, but paved the way for future insulin pumps. From there, they tried to make improvements in the hospital as well. And in doing that, they came up with a device, it's called a biostator. So this big machine that was able to infuse insulin and measure glucose at the same time. And then of course, that wasn't really transferable to a lot of other people. And since then, some of the advances that have come, of course, were getting down to an ambulatory pump. And so uh, they made this blue brick but it's really an auto injector. It's kind of the first foregoing of a, of a pump. But the challenges that existed back then were there wasn't really a means of automatically making the syringe move up or down. Everything had to be like spring loaded. And so those original devices functioned that way until of course the advent of high precision motors that were able to provide very small distances so that you can get the right amount of insulin in that made it uh, the ambulatory pump possible or the infusion pump as you know today. This blue brick, later called the auto syringe, was developed by Dean Kamen in 1976. Kamen is known for many inventions, one of his most well-known being the Segway. Auto syringe paved the way for Minimed's first pump, the 502, one of the first commercially available in 1983. What was the reaction to the 502? I think at first a lot of people were very skeptical. Well, what if this over delivers? What are we gonna do? We have no means of knowing if it happened. And so there was a lot of safety s uh, not only studies, but experience that needed to get garnered um, as a result of that. And then eventually people had come around and realized, you know, it's much better than having to constantly inject yourself. The insulin pump allowed people to, on at least a three-day basis, uh, not have to force themselves to give themselves an injection. They do it once with the infusion set or the patch and you know, they'd be good to go for three days. Meanwhile, in the late 1970s, a team at Minimed teamed up with NASA to build the world's first implantable pump. But first, a quick word from me. Hey, I hope you're enjoying today's video. This wouldn't be possible if it weren't for your support. A great way to show support is by giving this video a like, but even better is supporting me through Patreon. For the price of a latte a month, you'll get access to a bunch of exclusive content, interviews, videos, behind the scenes of me making videos, including deleted scenes of this video. So if you wanna watch that stuff and support the show, there's a link in the show notes. This is what makes it possible for me to continue making content like this. I want to make a series and we can all make that happen together. So check out my Patreon in the description. And for you diabetes who are already subscribed on Patreon, thank you so much. Back to the episode. In 1979, Alman formed a team of engineers to develop an implantable insulin pump with the help of NASA and the Applied Physics Laboratory at Johns Hopkins University. It's called PIMS, Programmable Implantable Medication System. The difference between what the implantable can offer versus subcutaneous um, insulin delivery is actually time. Today, when someone, before they eat, they're, they're all trained 15 minutes, 30 minutes before your meal to bolus. With an implantable pump, you don't need to do that. You can actually bolus on your meal, whatever it may be. The implantable's catheter delivers insulin inside the abdomen to the peritoneal cavity, similar to the delivery of insulin from the pancreas. There's no delay in absorption, and no wondering how long it will take for the insulin to make its way through fat and muscle tissue, like with external delivery used today. 
In 1986, the first pump was implanted at Johns Hopkins Hospital. One of the sort of unsuspected benefits for me has been a, a general upgrading of health. I feel better, and in many ways, it's like a new life. And it offered a new solution for a specific group of people. There are actually people that are allergic to insulin, subcutaneous insulin delivery. And so imagine if you can't take insulin and you have, uh, you know, type 1, that's a tough go. And so this was to help those kinds of folks. And then number two, there are a lot of people that are brittle and, and very sensitive um, to insulin as well. And because of how fast the action time is here, minimizing that time constant actually allows you to get more accurate with how much you need to dose. Medtronic has the implantable pump on display, and Ali explained how it works. What is this made of? So the case around the outside is titanium, and the internals are a lot like a pacemaker where it has uh, you know, a PCB inside of it, a battery um, that lasts a long time, and then a reservoir and a pumping mechanism. This port here is actually where you fill the insulin through the body. So this uh, injector is, is basically what goes through, and then they fill it this way. Um, and then that, that's how they get their insulin. And the insulin that goes into this is four times uh, more concentrated than the insulin you use in your pump today. So it's a U400 that we put inside of that. The implant was approved for use in Europe and under investigational use in the US. Hundreds of patients received the device. Minimed was in the process of incorporating a continuous glucose sensor, like the one seen here, and planned an algorithm to create an artificial pancreas. In 2007, the FDA investigational device exemption ended, and Medtronic decided not to move forward with commercialization in the US due to supply challenges for the special insulin needed. Nearly 200 patients continue to use it, and Medtronic continues to support these patients. So the question is, why didn't it work out? The dilemma with it, of course, is that it's carrying insulin and it's inside of your body. That, that insulin's gonna eventually run out and you've got to replace it. The pump needed to be refilled with insulin every six to eight weeks and flushed out every six months. Would you be okay with that trade-off? Let us know in the comments. And then the other, of course, it's, it's inside of your body um, and it takes a surgery to get it there. You know, that's not as comfortable as just putting on an infusion set and being on your way. So that's why it never really uh, took off. We actually still have quite a few patients on it. The people that are on it seem to like it a lot. And we want to make sure that they can continue getting the benefits of that. And so we've been actively working on options um, on that front. Is there a world where we see the implantable pump come back? I, I wouldn't rule it out, um, but I also think that the on-body options that we have right now are quite good. Um, so if the insulins get faster on the sub-Q side, uh, the need for an implantable kind of goes away. And so to this day, the insulin pump has remained outside the body. Medtronic has continued to upgrade and improve its line of pumps, and others joined the game, including a tubeless pump, the Omnipod, in 2003. These insulin pumps remained manual, injecting insulin at pre-programmed settings, but the goal was still to create an automatic closed loop pump, one that could adjust insulin delivery based on glucose levels, and unlike the biostator and backpack, it needed to be small. This required a device that measures blood glucose levels continuously. With that, a pump could adjust insulin delivery to prevent high and low glucose levels. This device would be called a continuous glucose monitor, or CGM, and Minimed was the first to release one in 1999. Yeah, this is actually the first CGM. So it had a part that went into the body and then it was connected to something that's like a wallet size that had to get carried um, with the person before there was uh, ability to do it over airwaves. And then that device over there, is that the charger? The charger for it, yeah. How often would you have to charge this? I, I would imagine just seeing the size of it probably a few days. So it had a separate component that was a disposable and all of this other stuff was essentially the durable component. So someone would charge it. Um, and then when it went into use, they would go ahead and put that on them. They would put tape over it, and then they would carry this with them so that they could see their CGM readings. Wow, and so this was significantly larger than what's used now, and Absolutely. it's also harder. It's stiffer, yeah. Unlike what you see today that's very flexible and very comfortable to wear, this was both deeper and more stiff. It went to wireless, and so really what this is is the first device that had a transmitter and the transmitter was separate from it, but it still used this device that had RF now built into it. So the whole notion of the belt clip and the whole bit, this is the first CGM that operated like that. 
In 2005, Medtronic began using pump hardware as a CGM receiver, called Guardian. A year later, the 522 finally brought CGM readings onto a pump. This was the first pump to send alerts for high and low glucose, so the user could take action when needed. While these CGMs didn't automate an insulin pump, they offered a clear view of glucose levels and helped people get a better understanding of their bodies and how foods affect them. When you're getting a point measurement with the blood glucose uh, meter, you're missing a lot of the information in between and it just depended upon when somebody took the information to know where they were. So the rise up after you eat food versus the climb down are very different to know. But if you get a single number on either side of that, you know, what are you gonna do with it? And so just understanding the dynamics of what happens with uh, glucose in itself was a massive improvement. CGMs weren't instantly adopted because people needed to calibrate them three to four times a day. They did, however, pave the way for pumps to automate insulin delivery. In 2013, Medtronic's 530G brought algorithm into play for the first time on consumer insulin pumps. There was a algorithm built into it, which we call threshold suspend for hypoglycemic shutoff of, of the insulin. And so was, think of it as trying to predict when somebody was gonna go low so that it, we shut off the insulin ahead of time. So that was actually the first advent of uh, an algorithm, so to speak. Um, was trying to make sure that uh, we cut off the insulin at the right time. And at least for the U.S., that was the first time uh, that we offered that technology uh, built into it. And from the FDA, it actually even got marked as an artificial pancreas because of it. While Medtronic and others worked on the next phase of algorithm, unrestricted by the FDA, the open source community was able to get algorithms out sooner and in 2016 released an app called Loop. This introduced the first smartphone and smart watch control, and the community continues to push innovation to this day. Following FDA clearance, Medtronic and other companies released their own automated systems, which are known as hybrid closed loop. With hybrid and why we use the word hybrid, it's doing that to manage background insulin not necessarily for meals. Basically, it's an algorithm that's looking at uh, the CGM values and deciding how much or how little on a five minute to five minute interval. So every time we get a CGM reading, how much insulin to provide to try to keep people at a target. And so it manages and maintains um, that level of insulin in order to try to keep people at that target. Current systems are great at preventing low glucose or hypoglycemia. They also curb high glucose levels, but Medtronic wants to rein in these hyperglycemic events into a tighter target range. Most of the comorbidities that people get as a result of um, having diabetes is because they are actively at uh, high levels of glucose. And so our job now is to get that to be in range, of course, and even take it one step further and make it in tighter range or even optimal range. So for us, we're talking more about how do we keep people between 70 and 140 milligrams per deciliter all the time. Work to tighten glucose levels and create a fully autonomous pump is currently underway. If there's one thing I've learned from my tour and my research, it's that diabetes technology has continued to evolve faster and faster. And even if we don't get a biological cure, a technological cure could be right around the corner. What do you think was the coolest innovation from this video? Let us know in the comments. And if you want to see even more, check out our deleted scenes on the Diabetic Patreon with the link in the description. I cannot believe how far diabetes technology has come, and I can't even imagine where it's going. But what I do know is as more tech comes out, it's going to make managing this disease way easier. Be sure to give this video a like and subscribe for more videos like this. I'm Justin, and I'll take you later.